It is the imperial ecologist Pardo Kynes, the father of Liet, who sets about attempting to transform the ecology of Arrakis on a planetary scale. This occurs long before the arrival of the Atreides on Arrakis, and makes up the first appendix in Dune, entitled The Ecology of Dune. Pardo, like his son Liet, is very much the western man amongst the Fremen, and he sees the ecological problems of Arrakis from the viewpoint that it is merely an expression of energy, a machine being driven by its sun. In viewing the problem of Arrakis, Pardo Kynes is immediately drawn to the Fremen population. This is not through any form of cultural admiration or sense of debt to the people of this world, being their imperial planetologist, but rather for the reason that he sees them as the tools with which he can shape the ecological future of Arrakis. With that in mind, Pardo quickly analyses the need to make the Fremen his ecological and geological tools for change, his geomorphic agents. In understanding this, he determines he needs to avoid any restrictions placed upon him and the population by the Harkonnen, followed by the need to ingratiate himself into the Fremen. To do this, he determines that he needs to marry a Fremen woman and produce a son, with whom he can begin an ecological education that can spread throughout the Fremen sieges. Pardo Kynes ingratiates himself to a degree with the Fremen by assisting some Fremen youths who are outnumbered and being attacked by Harkonnen soldiers. Kynes neither realises the fighting ability of these youths or his peril with the Fremen themselves, but the young Fremen bring him to their siege out of a degree of gratitude. Herbert describes Pardo at this juncture as not being naive, but rather a man who permits himself no distractions from his task, and instead identifies the enormous single-mindedness, the innocence with which he approached any problem. When Pardo arrives with the Fremen he begins telling them of his plans for Arrakis, oblivious to the debate which is going on around him. At this point, Pardo Kynes is viewed with suspicion by the Fremen, who distrust all those not of Arrakis, and although they are aware he is an agent of the Emperor as Imperial Planetologist, they are unsure of this madman, who also kills Harkonnen. However, Pardo has seen both the sacred Chris knives of the Fremen and one of their sieges, secrets that the people of the desert keep unto death. The decision to kill Kynes and take his water is soon made out of brutal necessity, and an experienced fighter is sent to kill him, along with two men to reclaim his water. Once again Herbert is showing us the harshness of life and the necessity of the severity of the Fremen ways. Simultaneously, he is illustrating that the Fremen act for the good of the collective, rather than out of any personal needs or desires. What follows? is intriguing from Herbert's point of view of the dangers of a hero to society as Kynes becomes an ecological hero to the Fremen. It's doubtful that Kynes even focused on his would-be executioner. He was talking to a group that spread around him at a cautious distance. He walked as he talked, a short circle, gesturing. Open water, Kynes said. Walk in the open without still suits. Water for dipping it out of a pond. Portigals! The knife man confronted him. Remove yourself, Kynes said, and went on talking about secret wind traps. He brushed past the man. Kynes's back stood open for the ceremonial blow. What went on in that would be executioner's mind cannot be known now. Did he finally listen to Kynes and believe? Who knows? But what he did is a matter of record. Uliet was his name. Older Liet. Uliet walked three paces and deliberately fell on his own knife, thus removing himself. Suicide? Some say Shai Hulud moved him. Talk about omens! From that instant, Kynes had but to point, saying, Go there. Entire Fremen tribes went. Men died. Women died. Children died. But they went. From this point on Pardo Kynes has fanatical loyalty from the Fremen who view Uliet's suicide as a mystical sign from Shai Hulud, 
the Fremen give Uliet a holy status in the afterlife, making him an Uma. Ironically, it is his own words to Liet, no more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero, that show how blind Pardo was to the Fremen's attitude to him, his western man focus being centred entirely on the problem of solving the ecological needs of Arrakis. Pardo is seen as a sadist, and the Fremen view him as someone who was not a madman totally, just mad enough to be holy. Once again begins the process of transforming the environment of Arrakis by the efforts of human beings. The previous transformation of the ecosystem of Arrakis was accidental and had many unusual consequences, but this time it will be quite deliberate. Pardo Kynes' means for doing so will be the Fremen, his geomorphic tools for change. This change will take, according to Kynes' estimates, three to five hundred years. In the timeline of the Dune series, two generations will have passed before the arrival of Paul Atreides and the ecological transformation of Arrakis has begun, undertaken by the Fremen, in the hope of one day realising their dream of turning their adopted world into a paradise. This process of change is managed by Pardot's son Liet, named in honour of Uliet. It is through the Firefreloik's feudal system that allows Liet to take over as Imperial Planetologist to Arrakis and to continue installing Fremen in key positions within the remnants of the Imperial Desert Botanic Testing Stations. These testing stations have existed on Arrakis prior to the discovery of the Spice Melange and have seemingly all but been abandoned once spice production began to flourish. Just after his arrival on Arrakis, Paul Atreides recalls viewing a film book about the planet's use by the Emperor as a testing station, which was used to study a number of species of desert flora and fauna that have been transplanted at some point to the desert world, and have ceased to exist elsewhere in the Imperium. Arrakis, His Imperial Majesty's Desert Botanical Testing Station. It was an old film book from before discovery of the spice. Names flitted through Paul's mind, each with its picture imprinted by the book's mnemonic pulse. Saguaro, Burrow Bush, Date Palm, Sand Verbena, Evening Primrose, Barrel Cactus, Incense Bush, Smoke Tree, Creosote Bush, Kit Fox, Desert Hawk, Kangaroo Mouse. Names and pictures. Names and pictures from man's tyrannic past, and many to be found now nowhere else in the universe, except here on Arrakis. Here we see the introduction of a number of species of flora and fauna specifically adapted to survive in the harsh desert environment. It is interesting to note that virtually none of the species indigenous to Arrakis are mentioned, all having been transplanted. These species are however introduced after the arrival of the sandworms, which we can assume have destroyed many of the indigenous life forms. The Atreides look into the possibility of discovering these stations, and it is interesting to note that the period before spice production begins is referred to as the Desert Botanical Testing Station period. Gurney Halleck's investigation into these stations reveals that there were once some 200 or more of these bases, all of which were apparently sealed and abandoned, possibly with their equipment intact. However, his questioning of local Fremen as to the location often garners but a single response. Liet knows. With Pardo Kynes and later his son Liet, the Fremen begin to infiltrate and reopen the testing stations, gathering the equipment that they needed to begin the process of the transformation of Arrakis, and creating the necessary conditions and tools to begin water collection on a massive scale underground. Kynes returned to his imperial chores, directing the biological testing stations, and now Fremen began to appear among the station personnel. The Fremen looked at each other. They were infiltrating the system, a possibility they'd never considered. Station tools began finding their way into the siege warrens, especially cutter rays, which were used to dig underground catch basins and hidden wind traps. Water began collecting in the basins. 
Pardo and Leit represent the Western man's attitudes to the treatment of ecology and environmental alteration. They analyse the problem and create a systemic approach to changing the ecology of Arrakis, with notably no person ever objecting to this in any way. Their attitude towards the Fremen is one of infiltration and manipulation, to the extent that Pardo, more than Leit, view the Fremen as the tools that they can use to achieve their goals. Herbert is again highlighting the infringements of Western societies and their ideologies on indigenous peoples, which often have disastrous consequences. For the Fremen, this will be their relegation to a museum people, and eventually the destruction of their way of life, and ultimately their planet. The appendix, The Ecology of Dune, reads like a mini-adventure in ecology, telling the story of Pardot Kynes and the beginnings of the ecological transformation of Arrakis. It is this section of Dune that reads more like an ecological primer than any other part of the book. Kynes's interactions with the Fremen again give us an idea as to the nature of these tribal people and how they adapt and interact with the harsh desert environment. In contrast to this, Herbert has them begin to follow Kynes's plans to terraform Arrakis, and the two viewpoints present a good contrast between a tribal desert people and a western modern man with his systems and methodologies. It is these western ideals that bring the Fremen's dream to fruition all too easily, and within a few thousand years their world and their way of life will be destroyed. For the reader of the Dune series, their take on the book as an ecological primer is presented by Herbert through immersion in the Fremen culture, as viewed through the eyes of the Atreides and the third person narrator. The Fremen were once a people known as the Zen Sunni Wanderers, sent into forced migration again and again over countless years, taking them from one world to the next. The reasons for their persecutions are not altogether clear but it seems likely they are founded in their religious beliefs. The Fremen in Dune can be viewed very much as a nomadic race of people whose belief systems are centred upon the religions of Zen Buddhism and Islam, and whose cultural stock is not far removed from that of the Bedouin. Everything about the Fremen, every single facet of their society, has been fully optimised and refined to allow these people to survive on Arrakis from the clothes they wear, their methods of combat and travel, to their religion and economy. The Fremen are first described as people who lived at the desert edge without Cade or Bashar to command them, Willow the Sand people, marked down on no census of the Imperial Regate. By not appearing on the Imperial Census, and by not participating in the feudal Faufrilaic system, the Fremen appear to be of limited numbers to both the agents of the Emperor and the Harkonnen when they rule Arrakis. It is only Duke Leto I and his staff who suspect that they exist in vast numbers, and may be the army that he seeks. Paul's education by his instructors provides us with some insight into this nomadic people of the desert. When discussing the Fremen's blue eyes, Paul tells Dr. Yui that he thinks they must be brave to live at the edge of that desert, and it becomes clear that the desert mystique of these people is already intriguing the young man before he has ever set eyes upon them. Yui tells him, they compose poems to their knives, their women are as fierce as the men, even Fremen children are violent and dangerous. As a people the Fremen are indeed violent and dangerous, hating the Harkonnen and killing them wherever they find them. In order to gain their attention, Duke Leto I instructs his swordmaster Duncan Idaho to liaise with the Fremen, believing correctly that Duncan possesses qualities that they will relate to. He tells Paul that his swordmaster is a proud and ruthless man, Duncan, but fond of the truth. I think the Fremen will admire him. If we're lucky, they may judge us by him. Duke Leto I judges the Fremen correctly here for these are indeed by their nature qualities that the best men and women of the sieges possess. The first notable Fremen that the reader encounters is Shadot Mapes, the head housekeeper of the palace at Arakin, who is more than she appears. Although the separation of desert Fremen and urban Fremen seems obvious by their society, 
they are for the most part a single people with no separate allegiances or politics. Shadowed Mapes has a hidden agenda, which is seemingly focused around the mysticism inherent with the Fremen, especially with regard to Paul as their Maddie, and of his mother the Lady Jessica. The Duke Leto recommends that the Lady Jessica retain Mapes as the head housekeeper when the Atreides arrive in Arakeen, even though he is aware of the old woman's keen interest to serve her in particular. Mapes provides a general introduction to the physicality of the Fremen, and to the nature of water conservation on Arrakis. Mapes's features suggest a consistency of appearance amongst the Fremen to the Lady Jessica when they first meet, as she notes that the woman looked as wrinkled and desiccated, prune dry and undernourished. She does however remind herself that Leto had said they were strong and vital, and there were the eyes of course, that wash of deepest darkest blue without any white, secretive, mysterious. Mapes has been sent by the Fremen to test the Lady Jessica against their myths of the Madi and his mother, and she bears literally and metaphorically a two-edged gift. Mapes brings a Chris knife, one of the traditional and ritual weapons of the Fremen made from a tooth of a sandworm. In questioning Jessica, Mapes hopes to determine if she really is the woman described by their legends, in actuality part of the Missionaria Protectiva. If this proves to be the case, then Mapes is to give the Chris knife as a gift to Jessica, if not, the weapon is to be used to kill her. It is when Jessica determines the meaning of the Chris knife, which she states as Maker, though intending to say Maker of Death instead, that the old woman accepts her as indeed being part of the legend. The knife as a weapon is revealing as to how the Fremen look at death, and the extent to which they go in order to preserve water. When the Fremen kill someone, they take the water from their body, preserving it out of necessity. When offered the weapon, Jessica notes that there is a glistening fluid upon its edge, which at first she suspects is poison. The blade according to Fremen custom cannot be drawn and sheathed again without shedding blood. Mapes offers Jessica the water of her life, but rather than killing the old woman, she instead gives her a slight scratch whereupon the blood wells up and stops flowing almost immediately. Jessica realises that the blade is actually coated with ultra-frost coagulation, the purpose of which is to prevent the loss of the body's moisture from a victim of the weapon. In taking a life, the Fremen are very careful to spill as little of an enemy's blood as possible, so that the water from it can be retained. This custom has led to those not from Arrakis believing the Fremen drink the blood of their own dead. The Atreides are also introduced to the Fremen through Dr Liet Kynes, the Imperial Planetologist and briefly the Fremen Naib Stilgar, leader of Siege Tabar. Once House Atreides has fallen and Arrakis is again in the hands of the Harkonnen and the Emperor, Paul and his mother Jessica flee into the deep desert, where they take refuge with Stilgar and his tribe of Fremen who call their home Siege Tabar. It is through Stilgar that the reader, along with Paul and Jessica, come to learn many of the ways of the Fremen and their relationship to the desert. As Paul becomes accustomed to Fremen life, he realises that he is being immersed in a culture that is harsh yet fully integrated into the ecology of Arrakis, what Herbert referred to as the ideas inflicted upon a society by their environment and the moral and ethical laws it creates. It came to him that he was surrounded by a way of life that could only be understood by postulating an ecology of ideas and values. He felt that this Fremen world was fishing for him, trying to snare him in its ways. Much of this new way of life is introduced to Paul and Jessica by Stilgar, who had before the fall of House Atreides accepted Duncan Idaho into his siege as a representative of the Duke's family on the condition that he served the siege as well as his old masters. He is a man described as having an aura of power that radiated from him, and is a tough yet fair and pragmatic leader, prone to succumbing as all Fremen do, to the tides of superstition that permeate their religious outlook. When accepting the dual allegiance of Duncan Idaho, 
he initially reveals some of the Fremen's water customs, allowing the Duke to keep the body of his fallen comrade Turok, but insisting that Duncan Idaho's water is ours. He also reveals early on to the Atreides that the mysterious Liet is in all probability a real person, telling them that he also serves two masters. Stilgar's belief in the Fremen superstitions sown by the Missionaria Protectiva is in one part what saves the Atreides from death. When Paul and Jessica first encounter Stilgar's troop from Siege Tavar, his men, and in particular Jamis, demand the Atreides fugitives are killed for their water as their laws require. These again are the harsh realities imposed on the collective by the environment itself, the law the Fremen call Istisla. You know the law, said the voice from the rocks. Ones who cannot live with the desert. Be quiet, Stilgar said. Times change. Stilgar counters Jamis by letting him know that his only concern is for the strength of the tribe, and reminds him that they have received a communication relating Paul and Jessica's worth to the tribe. Stilgar's pragmatism for his people is measured by his uncertainty as to whether Paul is the Lisan al Gaib, and his decision is to allow Paul to live but to take Jessica's water for the tribe. It is well that you see the reason, Stilgar said. We cannot dally here to test you, woman. Do you understand? We'd not want your shade to plague us. I will take the boy man, your son, and he shall have my countenance, sanctuary in my tribe. But for you, woman, you understand there is nothing personal in this. It is the rule, istisla, in the general interest. Is that not enough? Paul took a half step forward. What are you talking about? Stilgar flicked a glance across Paul, but kept his attention on Jessica. Unless you've been deep trained from childhood to live here, you could bring destruction onto an entire tribe. It is the law, and we cannot carry useless. Jessica is only spared death by proving her worth to Stilgar and does so by easily overpowering him with the weirding way, the Bene Gesserit martial art. The Fremen are astonished at her speed and martial prowess, and Stilgar informs her, We mean no harm to you now. Great gods, if you can do this to the strongest of us, you're worth ten times your weight of water. Even when some of his tribe are unsure whether to attack Jessica while she holds their leader hostage, Stilgar is forced to exclaim, Can't you see the worth of this woman? The conversation reveals more of the nature of water scarcity on Arrakis and how the Fremen measure value, as well as indicating the harsh realities that they live by. Herbert reiterates the nature of his higher moral and ethical laws when Jessica seeks assurances for her and Paul's safety amongst the Fremen. When questioning the truthfulness of Stilgar's word, his tone changes towards her, saying, We make no evening promises to be broken at dawn. When a man says a thing, that's the contract. More of the Fremen customs and their law of Istisla are revealed to the Atreides fugitives as they travel to the first stop of Stilgar's troop on the way to Siege Tabar, the Cave of Ridges. The Fremen travel by night and rest during the day hurrying to get under cover before the harsh sun rises. Provided with a place to rest, Paul and his mother are provided with food that reeked of spice. As they rest and eat, Stilgar calls out for men to place door seals at the cave entrance, to see to moisture security. When the Fremen are at rest, they remove their still suits, the vital piece of equipment they use to maintain their body's water when in the desert. Stilgar takes Jessica aside, and points across the desert to where their ultimate destination lies, and indicates in the distance his people working to the last minute to collect the spice. The discussion leads Jessica to admire Stilgar's people for their discipline, but Stilgar's intent in taking her aside is to explain further some of the Fremen's ways. He tells her the discipline is part of their tribal life, and also that, it is the way we choose among us for a leader. The leader is the one who is strongest, the one who brings water and security. In besting Stilgar in combat, 
Jessica has raised a problem for him, in that he is no longer seen as the strongest. Curious as to what this means, Stilgar explains to her that although she defeated him, the Fremen attribute this to her use of the Weirding Way, which they hope to learn, and that his position is not in jeopardy in that Jessica has not formally called him out. He notes that some members of his troop are curious to see if Jessica intends to call him out in a leadership challenge, but that ultimately if she succeeded, they would not follow her as she is not of the sand, a fact which he demonstrated during the previous night's crossing to the Cave of Ridges. Jessica is again impressed by the practical nature of the Fremen, and is curious to find out why they have overstretched themselves at this time in gathering spice to pay the guild. The economic necessities of the Fremen approach to ecology are made apparent here, Herbert demonstrating the need to have an understanding of the economic and political need they have in keeping their environmental ambitions secret. The guild here in this instant represents the exact opposite of the Fremen in the view of the economic requirements presented by the ecology of Arrakis. The bribes that the guild takes from Stilgar's people are purposely to hide the Fremen from any who may wish to observe their activities by satellite. There is little doubt that if the guild were aware of the Fremen's activities, they themselves would do something to halt them, as the ecological long term transformation they are working towards will ultimately destroy melange production on Arrakis. The guild, like so many other groups, rely almost entirely on the use of melange for space travel, which in turn grants them a monopoly of power within the Imperium. This is the concept of economic ecology, one that has become popular in eco-politics today, and has become a driving force in how governments deal with the growing concern of environmental issues. Jessica stopped in the act of turning away from him, looked back up into his face. The Guild? What has the Guild to do with your spice? It's Liet's command, Stilgar said. We know the reason but the taste of it sars us. We bribe the guild with a monstrous payment in spice to keep our skies clear of satellites and such that none may spy what we do to the face of Arrakis. She weighed out her words, remembering that Paul had said this must be the reason Arrakeen skies were clear of satellites. And what is it you do to the face of Arrakis that must not be seen? We change it, slowly but with certainty, to make it fit for human life. Our generation will not see it, nor our children, nor our children's children, nor the grandchildren of their children. But it will come. He stared with veiled eyes out over the basin. Open water and tall green plants and people walking freely without still suits. So that's the dream of this Liet Kynes, she thought, and she said, Bribes are dangerous. They have a way of growing larger and larger. They grow, he said but the slow way is the safe way. Stilgar continues to present himself as a man of practicalities, acknowledging that one day Jessica, out of the necessities of the good of the tribe, may have to call him out. He rather unsubtly suggests that Jessica might become one of his wives, but keeping with the myth of the Lisan al Gaib in mind, he presents her with another option, becoming the Sayadina, the Fremen's reverend mother. The following morning Stilgar's rule is being tested by Jamis, a young Fremen man who wishes to fight Paul to the death. Stilgar attempts to dissuade the young man, but Jamis continues to quote law at him, and although Stilgar can be flexible with his interpretation of the law when required, in this case it is the Amtal rule, which is designed to test the integrity of the prophecy regarding Paul and his mother. Paul lingers in killing Jamis unaware of the fact that the fight is one to the death. The fight represents a number of aspects in viewing the Fremen and their culture. First and foremost it is a rite of passage for Paul, and the Fremen no longer accept him as a mere lad. He is required to be given a tribal name that those amongst his new adopted siege may refer to him by. Paul's success in the Amtal combat has also confirmed to the Fremen that he is indeed their prophesied messiah, the Lisan al Gaib. The name Usul is given to him by the tribe, but he must also choose a name for himself as he enters manhood. 
Paul ultimately chooses the name of the kangaroo mouse, Moadib, but deigns that he doesn't feel it right to give up the name his father gave him. The Fremen again recognise this as an element of the Lisan al Gaib, reinforcing their myth, in actuality now present in Paul. Again, a murmuring response went through the troop as man turned to man. Wisdom with strength, couldn't ask more, it's the legend for sure. Lisan al Gaib, Lisan al Gaib. I will tell you a thing about your new name, Stilgar said. The choice pleases us. Muad'Dib is wise in the ways of the desert. Muad'Dib creates his own water. Muad'Dib hides from the sun and travels in the cool night. Muad'Dib is fruitful and multiplies over the land. Muad'Dib we call instructor of boys. That is a powerful base on which to build your life, Paul Muad'Dib, who is Usul among us. We welcome you. Water rationing practices are again presented as the Fremen begin to suit up, with the spare water from Jessica and Paul's packs being distributed to those who have lost water over the most recent journey. Stilgar informs Jessica that the water will be repaid to her at field rates, which are a ration of 10 to 1. Jessica, almost ready to protest at this, is cut short by Stilgar, who informs her that it is a wise rule as she will find out. The last water ritual that we encounter before Stilgar's troop reach Siege Tabar are the funeral rites for Jamis, who is buried with honour by the troop. As the ceremony begins, Jessica is becoming aware of her thirst, and as she observes the Fremen around her, realises the fact that this whole people could be trained to be thirsty only at given times. Stilgar tells her she will get used to the stillsuit as her body's water content falls to a lower level, and Jessica realises that her unconscious preoccupation with water is in actuality a preoccupation with moisture, and that this was a more subtle and profound matter. The funeral rites for Jamis are a communal affair involving each member of the troop mentioning some deed of Jamis's that benefited them, or a time when he saved their lives. Jamis's body has all the water removed from it, and Paul is shown this as he is the victor. Stilgar tells Jessica that this is another of the Fremen's rules. The flesh belongs to the person, but his water belongs to the tribe, except in the combat. Not understanding this, Chani explains to Paul that the water is presented to him in this case as it's because you have to fight in the open without stillsuits. The winner has to get his water back that he loses while fighting. Paul's reaction to this highlights the differences between the Atreides and the Fremen. Despondent after being forced to kill for the first time, Paul states quite firmly that he does not want Jamis's water. Chani does not understand this at all, stating quite simply that it is water, with an inflection in her voice that carries a great deal to Jessica's trained ear. She chides Paul into accepting Jamis's water in a tone that he recognises, and both of the Atreides come away from this situation with a new and fundamental understanding of water on this desert planet. On Arrakis, water was money. Another important realisation is, through the invocation of Shai Hulud by the Fremen during the funeral rites for Jamis, that the Fremen worshipped the great sandworms of Arrakis in a dualistic fashion. The utterances made for Jamis are to placate his shade as well as to distribute his possessions, and Paul joins in amongst the friends of the dead Fremen. In his grief at having killed for the first time, Paul cries, garnering an unusual reaction from the tribe. A voice hissed, He sheds tears. It was taken up around the ring. Usul gives moisture to the dead. He felt fingers touch his damp cheek, heard the awed whispers. Nothing on this planet had so forcibly hammered into her the ultimate value of water. Not the water cellars, not the dried skins of the natives, not still suits or the rules of water discipline. Here there is a substance more precious than all others, it was life itself and entwined all around with symbolism and ritual. Water. 
The funeral ceremony of Jamis and the events leading up to it are used by Herbert to present a number of the Fremen laws and customs, the economic means by which they proceed on their course for environmental change, the religious take that they have adopted in water preservation, but most importantly of all, the absolute importance of water on Arrakis. Water is wealth, life and death to the Fremen and every aspect of their lives is geared to preserving it where they have it, or gaining new water from the bodies of their enemies and from the very wind itself. Not one drop is wasted, and their abilities to distribute and measure water are incredibly accurate. The water of Jamis's body is measured out, and presented to Paul, totalling 33 litres and 7 and 33 second drachms of the tribe's water. He has become aware of the importance of water to the Fremen in various aspects of life, but one area he has not encountered is in its use in courtship. By now Paul knows the necessity of accepting the water for the tribe, and in doing so when presented with the metal rings which hold the water, asks Chani if she will hold them for him. There is an uncertain moment, and Stilgar tells Chani to keep the rings for Paul, without commitment until it's time to show him the manner of carrying them. Paul realises that he has missed something here, and sensing the feeling of humour around him, something bantering in it, and his mind linked up a prescient memory, water counters offered to a woman. Courtship Ritual The Fremen in working with the law of minimum have become supreme at gathering water, necessary as it is for not only their basic day-to-day -day survival needs, but also as a necessity to begin the ecological transformation of Arrakis. Before Stilgar's troop progress on their way to Siege Tabar, he escorts the Atreides through the areas of the Cave of Ridges previously hidden from them. The Cave Complex houses many of the trappings of Fremen ecological methods, and as they go past one particular irregular crack in the cave wall, they pass a dark honeycombed lattice that directs cold damp air into the cave from the surface. But it is Jessica who realises the level of the technological achievements of the Fremen, understanding that they have created wind traps from which they gather moisture. Wind trap, she thought. They've a concealed wind trap somewhere on the surface to funnel air down here into cooler regions and precipitate the moisture from it. The wind trap is not the only ecological marvel present in the desert hideaway of the Cave of Ridges. Stilgar escorts them to another region of the cave that illuminates a vast amount of water stretching into the darkness for over a hundred metres. Here Stilgar supervises the Fremen water masters as they empty the water that Paul has won from Jamis into the vast pool. The pool has a water meter which indicates the amount emptied to the exact measurement Paul had received, prompting Jessica to realise that the Fremen have superb accuracy in measurement, and that the key to understanding Fremen technology lies in a simple fact that they were perfectionists. The discipline of the Fremen in regard to this treasure trove of water here is made clear to Paul and Jessica by Stilgar, who tells them that amongst his troop there are those in need of water, yet they would come here and not touch this water. Stilgar informs them that there are more than 38 million decaliters in the Cave of Ridges which they keep sealed off from the water destroying Little Makers, or Sand Trout, and that the wealth represented by the water in the cave is only one of many such caches. The superb accuracy of the Fremen and their single mindedness towards their goal is revealed when Stilgar informs them that they know how much water is required to change the face of Arrakis to within a million decaliters. This discussion brings out the religious attitudes of the Fremen towards their ecological dream, and as Stilgar tells the Atreides of their intentions in detail, each sentence he utters is responded to by the chanting of the Fremen who call out the required ritual response, Bailal Kaifa. We will trap the dunes beneath grass plantings, Stilgar said, his voice growing stronger. We will tie the water into the soil with trees and undergrowth. Bai Lal Kaifa, intoned the troop. Each year the polar ice retreats, Stilgar said. 
By Lal Kaifa, they chanted. We shall make a homeworld of Arrakis, with melting lenses at the poles, with lakes in the temperate zones, and only the deep desert for the maker and his spice. By Lal Kaifa, and no man ever again shall want for water. It shall be his for dipping from well or pond or lake or canal. It shall run down through the quanets to feed our plants. It shall be there for any man to take. It shall be his for holding out his hand. By Lal Kaifa. Jessica felt the religious ritual in the words, noted her own instinctively awed response. They're in league with the future, she thought. They have their mountain to climb. This is the scientist's dream. And these simple people, these peasants, are filled with it. Her thoughts turned to Liet Kynes, the Emperor's planetary ecologist, the man who had gone native, and she wondered at him. This was a dream to capture men's souls, and she could sense the hand of the ecologist in it. This was a dream for which men would die willingly. It was another of the essential ingredients that she felt her son needed. People with a goal. Such people would be easy to imbue with fervour and fanaticism. They could be wielded like a sword to win back Paul's place for him. Jessica here is presenting the realisation of Herbert's great fear of the hero, political, religious or military, who can use and manipulate the ecological movement to their own needs. The Fremen are not just an ecological movement. They are a people who have ecology ingrained into every facet of their society. Possibly most important of all, their environmental goals are completely linked to their religious, martial and superstitious outlooks. Their single-mindedness in approaching their ecological dream of transforming their world indicates to Jessica that they are indeed an incredible force to be reckoned with and one who can return her son to his rightful political and economic position in the Empire. Paul understands this more than Jessica knows, still disturbed by his prescient visions of the Jihad that will come, fought in his name and under his family's banner. The introduction of Paul and his mother into the Fremen way of life ends with Paul's realisation of what his mother hopes he can achieve by using these people whilst not realising the Fremen also wish to use them for their own ends. At this stage, Paul is strongly resistant to the prescient visions that are increasingly getting stronger and more vivid, as he is exposed even more to the spice melange, which permeates every facet of desert life. In knowing that his mother seeks for him to use the Fremen, which will bring about the Jihad, he comes to a stark conclusion. Paul sat silently in the darkness, a single stark thought dominating his awareness. My mother is my enemy. She does not know it, but she is. She is bringing the jihad. She bore me. She trained me. She is my enemy. As we see with Paul and Jessica's introduction and immersion in Fremen life, Every aspect of their culture is deeply involved around their survival needs in the desert of Arrakis. Herbert's attention to detail is of paramount importance here. Fremen names have resonance with their need for water. Stilgar, or Stilgard, and Shadut Mapes, or Well Dipper, are obvious indicators of this. Their brutal customs feature the need to remove a body's water for the good of the tribe, and crying is seen as a great act of sacrifice to those who have passed into death. Their gods are dualistic and chthonic representations of the sandworms themselves, as both creator and adversary. The huge worms have even become a source of transport across the vast dunes and an unstoppable land-based war machine. The Fremen's bodies have adapted for the need for long-term water preservation, and have evolved with elongated intestines. The harshness of their existence shows that the tribes do not tolerate anyone who may bring harm to the siege because of ineptitude in the ways of the desert, or even through disability. As such, we see the Fremen prepared to kill Jessica, thinking her too old to learn their ways. The practice of eugenics is also present, in that the Fremen leave their blind to the desert, 
rather than have them hinder the progress of the tribe. The Fremen are so naturally adapted to life on Arrakis that Herbert examines them from a non-systems viewpoint. In representing an antithesis to western approaches of ecology and environmentalism, the flaw in Herbert's thinking is the Fremen do not have a systemic approach to life. Systems are created by human beings as a means for dealing with problems and their respective associations. Systems represent a means for human beings which, once tested, becomes dependable for dealing with their applications. Systems are indeed a fundamental part of Fremen life, from the means of how they travel, walking without rhythm and in a single file to disguise their numbers, to the way they measure, retain and preserve water by any means possible. The ultimate system that the Fremen have created on Arrakis for water preservation and survival is the stillsuit. The stillsuit is an item of clothing worn by the Fremen and only taken off when they reach the safety of Siege or Cave, where they can employ other moisture preservation seals. It is similar in concept to a spacesuit, but its job is to preserve and recycle all of a human being's water within the desert environment, ensuring someone who wears one can survive for long periods of time in the desert. The stillsuit is described as a micro sandwich, a highly efficient filter and heat exchange system, where the skin layer is porous. This allows perspiration to pass through it, having cooled the body, near normal evaporation process. The next two layers include heat exchange filaments and salt precipitators, salts reclaimed. While a Fremen wears a stillsuit, the motions of the body, especially breathing and some osmotic action provide the pumping force, while reclaimed water circulates to catch pockets from which you are able to drink from a tube attached to the neck. Urine and faeces are processed in the thigh pads, and one breathes in through a mouth filter and out through a nose tube. As Kynes points out to the Atreides, with a Fremen suit in good working order, you won't lose more than a thimbleful of moisture a day. The still suit is the ultimate survival tool, a clothing system that allows its wearer to lose a minimum of their body's water in the most extreme of environments. Even certain pack animals use the equivalent of still suits when in the desert environment. Fremen suits are noted for being of extremely high quality and efficiency in water reclamation, beyond those of ordinary suits sold by merchants in cities. It does however represent an idealistic technological system that seemingly stands in contradiction to a number of concepts that Frank Herbert presents in Dune. As a technological system, the Fremen have a dependency on still suits, as they do with almost all of their water-based technologies. Without them, the Fremen would no doubt be of little real threat to their enemies on Arrakis. When Liet Kynes is sent into the desert to die, the Harkonnen ensure that he has no stillsuit or water, knowing full well that either the desert or a worm will kill him. He's actually killed by a pre-spice mass. Regardless of the dependency of the Fremen upon them, the stillsuit represents a fascinating system created with the notion of man being in harmony with nature. As a concept, it is often one of the most discussed aspects of Herbert's Dune universe, and in consideration, also is an excellent means to show the sophistication of the Fremen as a tribal people. Conservation of water is of paramount importance on Arrakis, where all life must survive by the law of the minimum. At no point in the narrative does Frank Herbert long let his reader forget this. Water conservation's vital importance permeates Dune from even before the Atreides set foot on Arrakis. The banquet scene in Dune is where we meet those involved in the power play politics of Arrakis, notably those involved with commerce and banking, which translates to those who control the resources of water and melange. More importantly, Herbert uses the banquet scene to put across many of the environmental necessities of Arrakis, and uses the dinner conversations to allow Liet Kynes to put forward many of his, or Herbert's, ecological ideas. He recognised in the group a still suit manufacturer down from Carthag, an electronics equipment importer, a water shipper whose summer mansion was near his polar cap factory, a representative of the Guild Bank, lean and remote that one. 
a dealer in replacement parts for spice mining equipment, a thin and hard-faced woman whose escort service for off-planet visitors reputedly operated as cover for various smuggling, spying and blackmail operations. Of particular note among the group are Liet Kynes, in his role as the Imperial Planetologist and Judge of the Change, a fat water seller by the name of Lingar Butte, and a smuggler called Esmar Tuik. The banquet scene is very revealing about both the Atreides and their guests' attitude to water, who more so than their hosts, understand its preciousness on Arrakis. Only Kynes acts as one who truly considers the ecological law of the minimum at all times. The banquet scene's purpose is primarily to highlight the political tensions and power groups with vested interests in the Atreides' takeover of Imperial Spice production. It also marks the necessity of doing business on such a world for the Atreides. Behind the veneer of politicking however, Herbert as always continues to illustrate the true harshness of Arrakis and the need in particular for water conservation. The Duke gives a toast to his guests, which then causes them some embarrassment. As he has Gurney Hollock play a tune for them, he adds his own words that serve to extol and salute those who had died to bring the Atreides to their seemingly prominent position as governors of Arrakis. As he drinks his toast, the Duke carelessly lets some water spill over the brim of his cup before emptying the remaining half on the floor. As is the custom, the guests are by necessity required to follow suit, and although Jessica is the first to follow her Duke in this custom, she is curious at the reluctant reactions of their guests, most especially that of Dr Kynes. This was clean, potable water, not something already cast away in a sopping tile. Reluctance to just discard it exposed itself in trembling hands, delayed reactions as nervous laughter and violent obedience to the necessity. One woman dropped her flagon, looked the other way as her male companion recovered it. Kynes though, caught her attention most sharply. The planetologist hesitated, then emptied his flagon into a container beneath his jacket. He smiled at Jessica as he caught her watching him, raised the empty flagon to her in a silent toast. He appeared completely unembarrassed by his action. Prior to the arrival of the Atreides, it had been the custom of the Harkonnen to flaunt their lack of need for water to the local populace. They did so by having several basins flanking the doorways draped with tiles. Here the Harkonnen would drink several cups of water and carelessly rinse their hands, spilling it on the ground. They would then throw the tiles into the puddles of water and allow beggars to squeeze what they could from them. Duke Leto I is particularly disgusted by this and changes the custom, allowing anyone who asks for it a free cup of water during the Atreides mealtimes though his apparent disregard for water conservation in pouring out his cup would seem to go against this notion. However, in doing so, Herbert demonstrates as we later find out, that it is indeed a high sign of respect to give water to the dead, as Paul does when he sheds tears for the death of Janus. There are a number of staged exchanges in the ongoing conversations at the banquet table, some in part to demonstrate the nature of given power on Arrakis to the Atreides, others the product of espionage and intrigue. It is through Jessica's Bene Gesserit training that we observe much of the inner machinations of the feast as she subtly detects falsehoods and staged responses, even identifying the guild banker's accent as originating on Gidi Prime despite his obvious training to mask his origins. Both the guild banker and the water seller make it unsubtly clear that they control water to a large degree on Arrakis, the Duke vowing to do something about the water supply, so that Butte may not hold a club over his head. There is here an awareness of hydraulic despotism by the Atreides, and the possibility of it causing them great harm. When the Duke states that it is his intention to help transform the environment of Arrakis so that plants may grow again easily in the open and water would be available freely, this is not from any ecological desire to see the world transformed but simply to remove the ability for any man to hold a club over his head. The economics of ecology is fully on display in the banquet scene, especially in the form of the fear of hydraulic despotism that may be emplaced by the water sellers. 
As Butte, the water seller is strangely arrogant and rude to his host. Leto realises that this is perhaps the very reason that the man was able to do business with the Harkonnen when they governed Arrakis, yet was able to remain outside of their usually dictatorial iron grip of control. Leto held anger in check, staring at the man. Thoughts raced through his mind. It had taken bravery to challenge him in his own ducal castle, especially since they now had Butte's signature over a contract of allegiance. The action had taken, also, knowledge of personal power. Water was, indeed, power here. If water facilities were mined, for instance, ready to be destroyed at a signal, the man looked capable of such a thing. Destruction of water facilities might well destroy Arrakis. That could well have been the club this Butte held over the Harkonnens. The awareness of hydraulic despotism is of particular interest with Frank Herbert's Dune series, and it manifests itself in both the form of water on Arrakis and melange within the Greater Imperium. Dune is regarded as the foremost book in fiction to present this concept, sometimes also referred to as Oriental despotism. The term was coined by Karl August Wittfogel in Oriental Despotism, a Comparative Study of Total Power, and refers to the ability of a nation that utterly controls a particular resource, such as water or oil, and can cut off that resource at will, to the detriment of other nations or societies. The most recent example of this is the withholding of gas supplies to the Ukraine by the Russian gas supply company Gazprom from 2005 onwards. Economic ecology is also at work by the Fremen here, through the agency of Kynes and Chuik the Smuggler. Most worlds in the Imperium have weather control and sophisticated satellite systems, but Arrakis is one of the few worlds where this does not occur. Prior to moving to Arrakis, Paul asks Thufir Howitt why this is the case. He responds, Arrakis has special problems, costs are higher, and there'd be maintenance and the like. The Guild wants a dreadful high price for satellite control. This statement is a falsehood perpetuated by the Guild, for the real reason that there are no weather control satellites is because the Fremen bribe them with huge amounts of melange to keep it that way. As the Guild depend on the spice to navigate, their interest in stockpiling melange is paramount to them above all other considerations. As long as the Fremen pay their enormous bribes in melange, the Guild will refuse to put in place any such kind of satellite system. This in turn allows the Fremen to hide their movements and numbers, and continue their process of ecological transformation unabated by any political or military force in the Imperium. Their partnership with certain smugglers is essential to this, and again the smugglers would not be able to operate in the way they do with satellite coverage. As the conversation proceeds at the dinner table, the Guild Banker continues to use the discussion to bait the Atreides, and in particular Dr Kynes, who is known for his Fremen sympathies. The conversation begins discussing the nature of the birds of Arrakis, who are consistently carrion eaters and who drink blood when water is not available. This is an unsubtle reference to the Fremen and their customs. Liet Kynes coolly interjects in the conversation, bringing an ecological explanation for this behaviour, highlighting the necessity for this in terms of life's requirements within a difficult energy system. Do you mean, sir, that these birds are cannibals? That's an odd question, young master, the banker said. I merely said the birds drink blood. It doesn't have to be the blood of their own kind, does it? It was not an odd question, Paul said, and Jessica noted the brittle riposte quality of her training exposed in his voice. Most educated people know that the worst potential competition for any young organism can come from its own kind. He deliberately forked a bite of food from his companion's plate, ate it. They are eating from the same bowl, they have the same basic requirements. The banker stiffened, scowled at the duke. Do not make the error of considering my son a child, the duke said, and he smiled. Jessica glanced around the table noted that Butte had brightened that both Kynes and the smuggler, Chuik, were grinning. It's a rule of ecology, Kynes said, that the young master appears to understand quite well. 
The struggle between life elements is the struggle for the free energy of a system. Blood's an efficient energy source. The banker put down his fork, spoke in an angry voice. It's said that the Fremen scum drink the blood of their dead. Kynes shook his head, spoke in a lecturing tone. Not the blood, sir, but all of a man's water ultimately belongs to his people, to his tribe. It's a necessity when you live near the Great Flat. All water's precious there, and the human body is composed of some 70% water by weight. A dead man, surely, no longer requires that water. The conversation here ends with the banker insulting Kynes, who asks the man if he is challenging him. The banker backs down, losing face, but the poise and actions of those at the table that are ready to flee from possible violence are collective with the exception of Butte and Tuick. Constantly in a state of observation, Jessica notes that the water seller is enjoying the banker's discomfort, but that Tuick stands ready to aid Kynes if such is the necessity. His body language reveals to her that there is an accord of some kind between the planetologist and the smuggler. It also reveals that Kynes' attitude to the Atreides has softened somewhat from their initial encounters, whether this is from his own Fremen beliefs of the prophecy of the Lisan al Gaib, or because he senses that they share his desire to transform the environment of Arrakis to make it more hospitable to human life. Jessica also notes Kynes' attitude towards the banker and his readiness for violence, realising that he is a casual killer and guesses that this was a Fremen quality. After the overshadowing of potential violence, the conversation resumes, with Jessica directing it towards the importance of water conservation. At this point, Kynes continues with providing more insight into the ecology of Arrakis and hinting at the projects he and the Fremen have commenced. Here, he discusses Liebig's Law of the Minimum. Kynes looked at Jessica, said, The newcomer to Arrakis frequently underestimates the importance of water here. You are dealing, you see, with the law of the minimum. She heard the testing quality in his voice, said, Growth is limited by that necessity which is present in the least amount, and, naturally, the least favourable condition controls the growth rate. It's rare to find members of a great house aware of planetological problems, Kind said. Water is the least favourable condition for life on Arrakis. And remember that growth itself can produce unfavourable conditions unless treated with extreme care. Liebig's Law of the Minimum, or Theory of Minimum, was developed by the German botanist Karl Sprengel, and was a concept of agricultural theory. It is named Liebig's Law of the Minimum after Justus von Liebig, a German chemist who later popularised the theory. Liebig illustrated this idea by showing a barrel with staves of varying sizes, demonstrating that the barrel can only contain water up to the point of the shortest of these staves. As Kynes explains here, growth is controlled in any given environment by the least available resource, and on Arrakis this is water. Jessica picks up on Kynes' use of the word growth, questioning if Arrakis can have a more orderly water cycle to improve conditions of life, an idea that is scoffed at by the water seller Butte. Butte's response to this is to call Kynes a dreamer, stating that all the laboratory evidence is against him. Herbert has Kynes respond to this in a manner that echoes the ideas of the ecologist Paul Sears, stating that laboratory evidence blinds people to the fact that on Arrakis they are dealing with systems that exist out of doors, where plants and animals carry on their normal existence. A point of conjecture that Sears brings up is that modern man no longer follows the model that nature provides for existing in harmony with the world around him. He states, In producing his crops, he rarely follows the balanced model that exists in nature. Instead, he is coming to take the factory and the bacteriological laboratory as his model. Leto asks Kynes what it would take to begin the process of creating a self-sustaining system on Arrakis, to begin the process of change and improve the conditions for the creation of more water. Kynes explains that this requires building up to 3% of the green plant element on Arrakis involved in forming carbon compounds as foodstuffs, we've started the cyclic system, but also explains that water shortage is not the only problem in realising this goal. When asked what projects the planetologist has undertaken, Kynes states that there has been much time to set up what he calls the Tansley effect, 
a process of creating many small laboratorial experiments on an amateur basis from which he is drawing scientific data. The unusual chemical interchanges on Arrakis produce a great deal of oxygen, which, unbeknownst to most, is actually a byproduct of the sandworms. The water cellar Butte states firmly that there simply isn't enough water on Arrakis to begin such a transformation. Duke Leto asks if this is true, but Kynes conceals what he knows, faking uncertainty and telling the Duke that this may be the case. This angers Leto who wants a yes or no answer, but the political and economic factors represented by those attending the dinner make Kynes reluctant to discuss this any further in public. Leto is called away from the dinner and Paul is asked to take over as host. Another exchange between the guild banker and Paul ensues which again nearly results in violence at the table, this time with Tuick and Kynes openly supporting Paul. The final ecological discussion of the banquet scene features much deception on the part of Dr Kynes when the conversation turns to the uninhabited regions of the southern deep desert. His tale of the deep desert is reminiscent of a story to scare children, and its obvious intent is to suggest that death comes to those who dare venture there. Butte the water seller interjects suggesting the Fremen travel there, and that they have hunted out soaks and sip wells even in the southern latitudes. Kynes states rather too quickly that these are mere rumours, but his deception is picked up by Paul and Jessica with their Bene Gesserit training. The banquet scene allows Herbert to present the nature of the precarious environment of Arrakis from the viewpoints of those who live on the planet but are not Fremen. While Kynes is a Fremen, his conversation follows only the areas of general planetary ecology, doing his best to present false views of the real ecological work that is being undertaken. Anything that may indicate the real levels of water available or the Fremen's geomorphic ecological projects are concealed from those at the dinner, especially as their interests would run contrary to his own dream for Arrakis. The banquet scene does however serve one very important purpose, which is to strongly indicate the political and economic nature of ecology. Though most of Arrakis as we see it in June is the planet before the Fremen's ecological dream takes shape, we are able to witness its transformation as events transpire throughout the series. This transformation begins under Paul Atreides as the Emperor in Dune Messiah, but it is not until the events of Children of Dune, when Leto II realises the ramifications of what has begun. As the desert world changes, the sand trout are slowly disappearing. Leto realises that the sand worms are doomed unless the course of the ecological transformation is modified. Most of the observations of the transformation of Arrakis are seen through the youthful eyes of the twins Ganema and Leto II. It is actually through their other memory that they are able to compare the state of the environment from previous times. The changes to the ecosystem of Arrakis are happening on a slow gradual scale, and unnoticeable to most individuals. The Fremen would seemingly be happy with the return of water to the surface on the planet and the transplantations of greenery and animals to certain regions. To the Fremen this environmental change is the fulfilment of their long held dreams, entwined with their religious beliefs and view of Paul Atreides as Messiah. The twins recognise that if they are to convince people of the threat to the planet, they must do so in terms that the Fremen would understand. The new outlook involved a real change of consciousness which flooded them with observations. As Liet Kynes had said, the universe was a place of constant conversation between animal populations. The haploid sand trout had spoken to them as human animals. The tribes would understand a threat to water, Leto said. But it's a threat to more than water, it's a... She fell silent, understanding the deeper meaning of his words. Water was the ultimate power symbol on Arrakis, at their roots Fremen remained special application animals, desert survivors, governance experts under conditions of stress. And as water became plentiful, a strange symbol transfer came over them even while they understood the old necessities. You mean a threat to par, she corrected him. Of course. The Fremen, they realise, are becoming water fat, 
and it is only through the understanding that their wealth, the spice melange, may be threatened that the twins feel they may be able to convince the tribes to act. In addition to the sand trout dying out, the climate is also going through changes, becoming warmer in the northern latitudes, and atmospheric carbon dioxide is also increasing. Dew has also become plentiful on Arrakis, and more and more hectares of green land are being planted and landscaped each year. These indicators are essential to understanding Frank Herbert's viewpoint of ecology as being a long term process, which human beings in their short lives are often profoundly ignorant of. As the changes occurring to Arrakis are happening on such a swift ecological timescale, even those transformations which are happening within a generational framework are going unnoticed. The following quotation shows Herbert's attitudes perfectly that humans need to be made alert to what is happening to their environment. Limits of survival are set by climate, those long drifts of change which a generation may fail to notice, and it is the extremes of climate which set the pattern. Lonely, finite humans may observe climactic provinces, fluctuations of annual weather and, occasionally, may observe such things as, this is a colder year than I've ever known, such things are sensible, but humans are seldom alerted to the shifting average through a great span of years, and it is precisely in this alerting that humans learn how to survive on any planet. They must learn climate. Arrakis, the transformation after Hark Alada. Some of the Fremen do, however, notice the changes to the planet are having unforeseen consequences, as does Alia, the regent. In controlling the Atreides throne, she realises that the changes to Arrakis may threaten that which her hydraulic empire relies upon for control, namely Melange. Alia does not want this knowledge to come to the fore, relying on the religious appeal of the promise of the Atreides to change the face of Arrakis fulfilling Fremen prophecy. When the information of the damage being done to the sand trout populations is presented in front of her, Alia dismisses them as superstitions. The Atreides have used religions and mystical beliefs to further their needs amongst the Fremen to gain the empire, and now she uses them to dismiss the ecological concerns of the tribes. Yes, my lady, we of the desert see terrible things happening. The little makers come out of the sand as was foretold in the oldest prophecies. Shai Halud no longer can be found except in the deeps of the empty quarter. We have abandoned our friend, the desert. Gavin, what is this talk of little makers and the scarcity of sandworms? Mother of Moisture, he said, using her old Fremen title, we were warned of this in the Kitab al-Ibar. We beseech thee, let it not be forgotten that on the day Muad'Dib died, Arrakis turned by itself. We cannot abandon the desert. Ha! Alia sneered. The superstitious riffraff of the inner desert fear the ecological transformation. They, I hear you, Gavin, Jessica said. If the worms go, the spice goes. If the spice goes, what coin do we have to buy our way? Sounds of surprise, gasps and startled whispers could be heard spreading across the great hall. The chamber echoed to the sound. Alia shrugged. Superstitious nonsense. Jessica realises that Alia's responses are being dictated by her other memory, not knowing who it may be, but that it is simply someone who wishes to destroy the Atreides. Jessica understands that the ecological transformation has become a tempest out of control, and that the planet Arrakis is turning against those who live on it. Alia's response to this indicates her desire, even delight, for the ecological changes occurring to continue at pace. Rather than the Atreides throne suffering from the loss of Melange on Arrakis, she understands that the scarcity of this commodity will only increase their power in the Imperium. The Atreides, with her as regent, will control what little remains of the spice Melange making it a rarer commodity than ever before. Their hydraulic despotism will be unbreakable, 
and in a universe where withdrawal from spice use is fatal, all will seek the Imperium's favour for this precious commodity. Control of scarce melange will allow the Atreides to permanently seal their authority on the Empire of a Thousand Worlds, and have total control over powerful factions such as the Guild and the Bene Gesserit, both of whom depend heavily on the spice. Spice production will fall to nothing, or at best a fraction of its former level, and when word of that gets out, We'll have a quarter on the most priceless product in the universe, Alia shouted. We'll have a corner on hell, Jessica raged. With Jessica and the twins under threat from the deranged Alia, it falls to Leto II to accept the requirements of the Golden Path and begin his transformation into the half-man, half-worm, God Emperor. As Leto II transforms himself, he begins the undertaking of slowing the process of ecological change by making guerrilla attacks against areas in full swing of environmental alteration. He destroys a number of such places with the power the worms have given him, his plan to ensure that, within a month, the ecological transformation will have been set back a full generation. That'll give us space to develop the new timetable. When we return to Arrakis in God Emperor of Dune, some three and a half thousand years have passed, and the transformation of Arrakis is complete, though now following the plans of Leto II's Golden Path. Arrakis now only has one desert, Leto II's personal sarir, and the sandworms are extinct. The Fremen as a people are all but gone, those remaining being called Museum Fremen, mere shadows of their ancestors with no survival skills. Melange is scarce, the only real source of it being Leto II's personal hoard. His rule as the leader of a hydraulic empire is absolute, and with his virtual invulnerability and almost total prescience, he is worshipped as a living god. It is with Leto II's sacrifice at the end of his rule that will recreate the conditions of Arrakis back into a hostile world again where the sandworms can return although they will not be quite the same. Each will carry a pearl of his awareness, granting him a form of immortality as a divided god. Leto II explains to Maneo how this transformation will bring about a new Arrakis, harsher than before, creating an environment that will bring new rigour to mankind. This is the goal of the Golden Path. Someday I will go back into the sand, I will be the source of spice then. You, Lord? And I will produce something just as wonderful, more sand trout, a hybrid, and a prolific breeder. Trembling at this revelation, Moneo stared at the shadowy figure of the god emperor who spoke of such marvels. The sand trout, Lord Leto said, will link themselves into large living bubbles to enclose this planet's water deep underground, just as it was in the June times. All of the water, Lord? Most of it. Within three hundred years, the sandworm once more will reign here. It will be a new kind of sandworm, I promise you. How is that, Lord? It will have animal awareness and a new cunning. The spice will be more dangerous to seek and far more perilous to keep. Maneo had looked up at the cavern's rocky ceiling, his imagination probing through the rock to the surface. Everything desert again, Lord? Water courses will fill with sand, crops will be choked and killed, trees will be covered by great moving dunes, the sand death will spread until… until a subtle signal is heard in the barren lands. What signal, Lord? The signal for the next cycle, the coming of the Maker, the coming of Shai Halud. Will that be you, Lord? Yes! The great sandworm of Dune will rise once more from the deeps. This land will be again the domain of spice and worm. But what of the people, Lord? All of the people? Many will die. Food plants and the abundant growth of this land will be parched. Without nourishment, meat animals will die. Will everyone go hungry, Lord? 
undernourishment and the old diseases will stalk the land, while only the hardiest survive, the hardiest and most brutal. Leto II's transformation of Arrakis, his adjustment of the ecological plans of the old Atreides Empire and its regency, are undertaken in the long term to allow the conditions to be created that will permit the reintroduction of the new sandworm species. As the little makers were dying out under the previous ecological changes, sand trout cannot move into the sandworm stage of their life cycle without abundant sources of water which they insist and devour. Leto II's understanding of the life cycle of the sandworm is due to his symbiosis with the worms, his other memory, and his prescience. It is this that allows him to function as a perfect ecologist, creating both the conditions for the transformation of Arrakis and foreseeing the consequences. To Frank Herbert, ecology was the science of the understanding of consequences, and Leto II, as a tyrant, controls the empire through the ecology of Arrakis as a hydraulic dictator. The Atreides control of human institutions and systems through ecology is fundamental to his warnings of dangerous heroes using ecology as a platform for their own specific needs. The mistakes that Paul Atreides makes in beginning the Golden Path and then turning away from it are amplified throughout the millennium, ultimately destroying the Fremen. The use of hydraulic despotism also results in the destruction of Arrakis at the end of Chapter House Dune, artificial melange meaning the old empire has finally died away. The use and reliance of systems by human beings in governing their actions, in this specific case ecology as a tool for environmental, social, political and religious change, also marks Herbert's belief in both understanding systems and our reliance upon them. In the case of the ecological and political transformation of Arrakis, and subsequently the Empire, Herbert shows the need to break away from the stagnancy that such systems can cause by their feedback loops. The nature of chaos in creating new dynamics within such systems is illustrated most interestingly by Palumbo's examination of the Dune series as a chaos theory model showing that Arrakis' ecology is a dynamical system that might be radically altered through a minimal change in a key variable affecting its interlocking feedback loops. In its portrayal of ecology on a planetary scale, the Dune series represents the most immersive and complex examination of humanity's environmental concerns that science fiction had ever seen. Herbert plunges the reader into an incredibly detailed desert planet and its people, who have a complex and fully integrated means of survival upon it. In doing so, no facet of the complexities of ecology can be lost in such a story. Dune is indeed an ecological primer of sorts, and its examination of the complexities of environmental issues that are increasingly important in today's society show clearly why Dune and its sequels remain bestsellers over 50 years after their initial publication, and why Dune itself is seen as the pinnacle of science fiction literature.